artillery preparation, pumped in two million rounds of artillery. Getting the area up for one day. On the seventh day, the British infantry went in. First day's casualty, 60,000. One day. 60,000 casualties. One day. That went on for, I think, five months. month and lost over 500,000 troops. Okay. So, they figured, well, that didn't work so good. we got to correct it. So, in 1917, the Third Battle of the Krieger, Battle of Passion, was the British, like you call it, small section. Right? What they did is they had a Almost a two week artillery preparation pumped in over four million rounds. British infantry went again, they failed once again. What they didn't realize, they tried to actually have a quantitative change and gain success. What they needed was a qualitative change. In other words, they had to do things different, not just try to do the same way with more emphasis. More emphasis. <clears throat> so, why would that fail? Well, think about it. A couple of numbers. One, if you're laying a one week's artillery preparation, you know, after a couple of days, your adversary is going to get wise that something's happening in that sector of the front. So we can transfer reserves behind the front. Two, because they've had earlier artillery preparation, and they know the damage of artillery. What you do is you start dispersing your people in the front. Instead of lying, you start dispersing throughout the front, also placing in bunkers to minimize the effects of artillery. And three, if you're going to be able to conduct one of those barrages, Two million or four million, or large expenditures of ammunition. The only way you can do that very near the front, you have to build up huge artillery stockings or artillery belt. Well, that takes time. In the meantime, enemy recce and intelligence activity is going to notice that. So if you're building a certain sector, they say, hey, something's going to happen here pretty soon. <clears throat> In other words, it's not too surprising. Quite often. And then the tactics themselves, they use it. I didn't build up the middle. So you begin to see that kind of thing. What okay. So now a way out. We rise in so called infiltration tactics and guerrilla tactics. There was a French captain by the name of Andre Lafarge in 1915 who wrote a pamphlet as a way of trying to go through these fortifications, <coughs> which is infiltration tactics. And uh, the Germans captured the pamphlet, plus they were thinking of similar lines, so it acted as a catalyst, and so they started training a lot of troops. And of course, they washed over the West in the spring of 1980. Sometimes they're attributable to a General von Houdier. And the reason why I have a question mark there is he was not an architect of that. He just had to be one of the commanders of the German side who did employ those attacks. At the macro level, it's attributable to Ludendorff. He did recognize the importance of it, so he did support the whole effort. And Rightly so, was deemed a macro level architect. And then another tactic, so the grow attack was seen through uh, Lawrence of Arabia, or Peter O'Toole, if you saw the movie. <laughs> Seven Pillars of Wisdom. People enjoyed the book. In any case, we see he recognized the importance of that kind of thing, but there's even another guy who was probably more adept at it than named Lawrence, a guy by the name of uh, Lettow Warbeck, Prussian, down in Germany, East Africa. And with just a few officers and a couple thousand enlisted men and some Africans, he surrendered after Germany did during World War One. He fought off between 200 and 250,000 British troops. And he had 20 or 30 generals arrayed against the Italy firm. And then he actually became stronger toward the end. They had to convince him that Germany lost the war. Is that, is that in Europe or is that in Africa? Germany, East Africa. Yeah. Yeah. Down in Germany, East Africa. And even in the British official accounts, they tend to give him more credit than Lawrence. Not that Lawrence wasn't a successful commander. But remember, Lawrence was being supplied by Allen being in the Middle East, whereas Lettow Warbeck was virtually cut off and was literally living off the British himself. So we see that kind of thing. Now what I want to do is we're going to look first at the infiltration tactics and guerrilla tactics and compassion, which is what we can do that. So now let's look at the infiltration tactics. I'll let you read this, get sort of a feel for it, and I'll discuss it. This is the one charge snapshot. <clears throat> but the key point, I'll discuss this with some of the people back to the medic part time. But the key point, instead of just trying to destroy people, you use it to disrupt or suppress the defense. That's one aspect of it, and obscure the assault. So in that sense, you can think of the artillery as being a chain for the following effort, following effort <coughs> to be. And look at the second boat, these small teams, instead of these huge formations going through these small little squads. 10, 12, or 14 people. 
There's a little swarm. Each one working its way independently forward. They're spaced out laterally longitudinally. And what they're trying to do is find the gaps or weaknesses in front, trying to flow into it. And then behind them, the small battles are working in behind them. They go through and then try to cave in the local defense areas the Germans have there from the flank and the rear. And then even larger groups, reserves and stronger following echelons go through those breaches and widen even more, always working flanks and rear, until finally you've got what little heart likes to call a torrent pouring through the front. But at every level, you're trying to work the guy's vulnerabilities and weaknesses. Now, if you read that, you begin to say, well, my God, that sounds like what Sun Tzu was saying about water going downhill. That's Sun Tzu tactic. That's what it took to World War I before they come up with Sun Tzu tactic. He wrote that back in somewhere between 300 and 500 BC, as people say. So we begin to see that kind of thing. And of course, the idea is quite simple. <coughs> Eruption of many thrusts, not just one thrust, that gets blocked, the other ones don't go through, you're just trying to pour through. And the idea is to break through. Enveloping and probably dragons already came in. Okay? So we see a different kind of thing. And it raises this point. Now, they may create some vivid images in your mind, but what it really doesn't address is deal with how the fire movement schemes work. How you use firepower with movement as a basis in order to gain leverage. So let's give you an insight into that. Here's the key thing. Fire at all levels. Artillery, mortar, machine guns. In other words, you have upper level, you have huge artillery uh, uh, pieces down at the lowest level, you have mortars, machine guns, etc. In any case, the idea, the idea is to pin your adversary down. In other words, you're not going to stand up when some guy's spraying the area with an artillery machine gun fire. You're going to get pinned down. Plus, together with gas and smoke, it tends to obscure what's going on. Plus, <coughs> thereby, Tends to cloak infiltrators' movement. The infiltrators, in the meantime, the way they're working their way more, instead of these nice, neat, huge formations, are slithering through these small little groupies, swarms we call them, are hard to see, too. So you combine all that together, they capture the attention of the spirit of the interstate character, they really deny your adversary an opportunity to picture what's taking place. You can't get a good image of what's going on. But remember, if you're not oriented, how are you going to make the appropriate decision, take the appropriate action? You can't. When you're talking about a guy getting a picture in his mind, you're talking about orientation. So you've skewed things sufficiently enough, he can't get a proper orientation, therefore he can't make the proper decision to take the appropriate action. So what happens, the result's not too surprising. People had to face that, all of a sudden they said, these people are moving up, coming out of nowhere, and they're being marched off as prisoners, they're totally confused, and they can't figure out even what hit them. Game's over. We've even seen some of those accounts in Vietnam, the guys holding positions, all of a sudden these guys are in behind them and can't figure out where they came from and caused all kinds of panic and chaos. Mm -hmm. Infiltration. So that's a very different kind of thing. The key thing, by doing it, you're really, in a sense, screwing up a zoo. He doesn't get good observations. The orientation is screwed up, the decisions are screwed up, his actions are screwed up. It's very good. So, we look at it, then what's the essence of the method? You're really trying to cloud and distort your state. You're trying to improve your mobility to avoid yet focus effort. You're trying to penetrate his system. You're trying to shatter it, and of course, mop up to this method degree. And the intent's quite simple. You use tactical spurs in a focused way to gain tactical success and expand it to grand tactics and hopefully strategic, which they didn't get to comment in a minute. Now think about Napoleon. What did he do? He used grand, I mean, he used strategic to gain grand tactical tactical. Now we're going the opposite. <coughs> tactical to gain grand tactical strategic. Interesting. Plus, Napoleon, what else did he have? He had strategic dispersion followed by a tactical concentration. Here you have tactical dispersion with strategic focus. So you have two inversions. Why did you have them? Very simple. Fire them. They had to change. They were blowing their people up. And forced them to move. of modern weapons, of course, so the implications quite small. Small units are splitting tactical dispersion. 
rather large formation providing by the principle of concentration. Remember, Napoleon's strategic dispersion followed by tactical concentration. Now you've got tactical dispersion with strategic focus or concentration. Just the opposite. By doing that, then you can pump up his pressure, paralyze him, bring down his system. Raise an interesting question. Are they rejecting the Napoleonic methods, these infiltration methods, or are the applications methods under approximately different guidance? And of course, the mere fact that I would put that thing after the double dash, I'm suggesting their application under different guidance. <coughs> now we can also go back to, on this chart, we'll answer the 19th century question we had not answered before. So if you look at these infiltration fire movement schemes, you can think of them as Napoleon's multi thrust strategic penetration movement. Remember, he and his units separate the divisions pouring to a country's strategic level. Now we're doing it all the way down to squad level. While well, it is fine green, but pulling on strategic maneuvers down to squad level in order to penetrate a guy's system. And until the rise of infiltration tactics the use of tanks by the Allies, neither 19th century nor 20th century commands were able to evolve effective penetration maneuvers. If you don't penetrate the other guy's system, why should he throw the towel? <laughs> If you can't penetrate moral, mental, or physical stability, why should he quit? He won't. He shouldn't. I wouldn't. Huh? And if he starts getting inside his mind, system, all the things start being like going to hell, his confidence starts going south. So now, why? Now we answer, remember, we went back to that question in the 19th century. Why were the 19th century and 20th century commanders unable to evolve effective penetration? The aristocratic tradition, the top down command and control system, the slavish addiction, the principle of concentration, the drill regulation mindset. You put them all together, what are they? They're an obsession for control. What it is? An obsession for control by high level superiors or low level subordinates. When you do that, you start restricting imagination, initiative, and adaptability. If you do that, now you can't evolve into new methods. Because you've got all those constraints upon you. And you see it, you go back and read the accounts, and you say, God, why didn't these guys change? They didn't blow away. And all they're worrying about is whether they're going to make the line this way or the, or the column this way. And I mean, you talk about the little, little teeny changes, and they are making something dramatic. They had to do something totally different. They couldn't see it. You people did. Eventually they did. I might add, even after World War I, we hadn't seen the Germans. It took us a while. Why did we Some have people still don't see it. <laughs> because they want to control. So i got to control those people. If you got them all slithering through a different direction, how do I control them? Why, why did we end up winning World War I? Hmm? Germans were better at this. How are we? Why did we win World War One? <laughs> no, I said I would, remember. I said they succeeded the tactical and grand tactical. Never succeeded the strategic level. Remember, I said it earlier. The methods were good, but they also didn't apply it entirely correctly. We'll get that. I'm not up to that chart yet. So that's a good question. I want to bring a couple other points, but this is very important. Also, the Germans. Remember I said, remember we used the tanks, they didn't use it for a while, and that helped us a lot too. They tend to neglect, just because they got the infiltration tactics right doesn't mean they got a lot of other things right. But I want to bring that point home, because we've had trouble being able to adapt down to the lower level. And it's not that easy, there's some other things you can get in the way, we have, we have to get some other information. But now, to try to get at your question. Okay, in infiltration tactics, they did succeed down to the lower level, but they coupled with ultimate failure to court army level. The question is why did that occur? One, Ludendorff violated his own concept because when he started doing, he laid out his plan. When they got hung up, he wanted to go the same direction. He started feeding failure rather than success. Wasn't able to adapt. Now, that's sort of a harsh statement. I'm going to soften it in just a minute. There's some comments that have to be uh, laid in there. Another one. Exhaustion of combat teams leading the assault. After they went forward, they didn't replace those teams. They got tired out and the assault withered away. 
how they would you do it when you have a salt go in like that when you're doing that when, when one goes so far then you start rotating the reserves to be the point back and forth so you keep the, keep the momentum of the, of the operation going and then here's another important logistics were too inflexible to support that fluid penetration we didn't have that gasoline engine at that time plus those battlefields were all torn up it was hard to move forward in other words to support that they could exploit those penetrations or even bring up the artillery when they did need it and the fourth was a very key point. Communication was too immobile to allow command to quickly identify and reinforce. Let me <clears throat> pinch in on that point. Let's pretend you're a, you're a front commander and you do want to use these infiltration tactics during your exploit, you have to search all those meetings. Well, first of all, you gotta know where they are. You have some feeling where they are so you can do this. Okay, the people who are succeeding know that. Some are gonna get hung up, some are gonna succeed. You want to feed success, not failure. But then they're going to have to transmit those instructions back to the higher level commander so he can go through. Well, they didn't have the communication, they could do that too well. Yet he's got to allocate the forces, he has to know where it is. If he doesn't know, then he's going to start pumping forces up blind alleys or coolies off. In other words, you have to have a good bottom up communication system so the, the commander at the top side can reallocate or allocate correctly. So he controls the follow on forces and the reserves. He depends upon his decision how they're going to be allocated or where they're going to be allocated. And then finally, the elastic defense. Now, it was initially developed by the Germans, excuse me, the idea was initially French, but it was developed by the Germans and borrowed by the French by Bataan, taking the fourth drive. The basic idea, rather than trying to defend the terrain, use the terrain as a medium for maneuver. Uh, another term. And so you bend before the assault, move back before the assault, drag the German infantry out front of their artillery, pour, pour your artillery in, and then locally close them off from the flanks and the rear. Remember, I said, terrain doesn't fight the war, the machines don't fight the war, the people don't use their minds. So we get this thing where we always have to defend every foot of the terrain. Uh, the terrain doesn't fight. Use the terrain as a medium for move in order to take out the force. Thanks for everybody going forward or backwards, as long as you have the initiative and you're realizing your purpose against your adversary. So we see these kinds of things. Plus, the U.S. also had entered the war there. That's one of the reasons why the Germans want to get that drive going before we can get over there and bring our force to bear. <coughs> okay? Now let's look at Gorilla. Follow up Lauren. He recognized how important support of the population was. Like modern world. In other words, the medium to which you operate in plus you disguise your own activity. Note this. I do these quotes. Get inside your mind. That's straight from Florence. You don't see that often. But I saw it at West, and that's the very thing I'm talking about. Get inside your mind. Okay, quote. Another thing, note this. Be an idea or a thing. Drifting about like a gas, that's even more delicate than water. Because it brings out the idea of not only fluidity, but being invisible, inconspicuous, or indistinct. I can't get an image of what you're up to. <clears throat> And then attacking in depth. So in other words, you're doing different areas too. Well, you think about this kind of thing and combine it with attacking should be tip and run, not push it with throw. You're in and out, going in every direction on your adversary. Use of the strongest, smallest force and quickest time to spur this play. Well, think about that. If you're doing all these kinds of things, it's like the Mongols. Pretty soon you seem to be everywhere, yet nowhere. They don't know how to cope with it. And his strategy was very simple. War of attack. And his basic strategy in terms of war of attack, when he really tried to do his strategy was to pin the Turks down along the Hejaz Railroad. Between Medina and Damascus. And the reason why he wanted to pin them down, he wanted to get them to bring in more troops, more supplies to suck up their effort there, because he was a chain for Allenby's chief, which was a stroke into Palestine. In other words, to free up the resistance against Allenby. In other words, he was holding them by the nose, so Allenby had fewer, uh, lesser resistance elsewhere. In this sense, the guerrillas were chained. And you can think of the same thing. Remember what I said about Grant? Grant, in the final drive, there, remember, he was holding Lee up near Richmond while Sherman was cascading through the south. So Lee couldn't come to the city. He backed off when he got Richmond. We see these changes. So these things are played. I off one way in order to stroke in another direction. <laughs> and note this. 
never on the defense except on accident and error. Here's where many military men make that mistake. They think they're on the defense because they're moving backwards. Let me preempt myself here. Mao said there were three phases to a guerrilla campaign. Strategic withdrawal, strategic equilibrium, and strategic offense. But they were all tactical offense, tactical offense, tactical offense. Because what the guerrillas understood, brain doesn't wage war, machines don't wage war, people are going to use their mind. So his way of depicting whether you're on an offense or defense, do I or do I not have the initiative? If I've got the initiative, it makes no difference whether I move forward, backward, or in any direction. I'm the offense now. The initiative. Key word. Now we have a principle of war called the offense. You know, the British tried that at the Somme and they blew away 60,000 guys in one day. Now they're starting to modify. Notice lately the, air, the army came out with the principle of initiative. <clears throat> of offense. That's correct. Although I tend not to like the principle of war, but nevertheless, it's going in the right direction. The idea of initiative. Because the guerrillas do understand. Brain doesn't play the war. People do use or not. Mind. So initiative is tied to people. Do I or do I not have it? How do I know when I got the initiative? We've tied to something else. If I'm getting inside my adversary's loop, I got the initiative. If he's getting inside my loop, he's got the initiative. In other words, if I've got him so fouled up that he can't make the appropriate decision to take the proper actions, I'm getting the initiative. Makes no difference what direction I'm moving in. So you can tie all these things together. And of course, the idea behind it, I put it a little differently, the actual words that Lawrence used was to extrude the Turks from Arabia. But the techniques that he was using was really just disintegrating even their ability to govern. <coughs> so then, the impression when you look at this, among others, also hearts and others, and also he was privy to the critique the German army conducted upon itself, in which they cited two ingredients they had to pay more attention to. One will look at each one. First, the Soviet revolutionary strategy, then blistering, then grow warfare. Let's look at.